Many times we like to think that simply by adding meditation to our lives, the effects of the meditation will permeate throughout our whole lives without our having to do much of anything else. Simply add the meditation to the mix of your life and it changes all the other ingredients. That's what we'd like to think, but it doesn't really work that way. You have to remake your life to make it a good place for the meditation to seep through, because there are some activities or some states of mind that are really resistant to having any influence from the meditation. This is why when you're meditating, you also have to look at the way you live your life, your day-to-day -day activities. And see if you're creating a conducive place to meditate, a conducive space, a conducive environment for the meditation to thrive and spread. Otherwise, the meditation just fits into cracks here and there. It never gets to permeate much of anything at all. There's a teaching in the, in the canon on five things that a new monk should keep in mind. It applies not only to new monks, but also to anyone who wants to live a life where the meditation can seep through and permeate the whole of your life. The first thing is virtue. Make sure you stick to your precepts. In the case of the monks, of course, this is the Pathimokha. In the case of the lay people, it's the five precepts, and on occasion the eight. Because when you're holding to the precepts, you're holding to firm principles in your life. The Buddha talks about observing the precepts as a gift, a gift both to yourself and to the people around you. In other words, you give protection to other people's lives, their property, their knowledge of the truth. You protect them from being drunk. You're being drunk. You protect them from your engaging in illicit sex. And when these principles become precepts, in other words, something that you hold to in all circumstances, but it says you're giving unlimited protection, unlimited safety to other beings, and then you have a share in that safety and a share in that protection yourself. So on the one hand, the precepts create an environment where there's more protection. When there's more protection, it's easier to meditate. At the same time, it creates that attitude of giving. You realize that for your sake of your own happiness, you have to give. When you have that attitude, then it gets easier to meditate. Because all too often people come to the meditation with a question, what can I get out of this? Of course, if you're used to giving and seeing the results, the good results that come from giving, you're more likely to ask, what can I give to the meditation? What needs to be given for the good results to come? And you're more willing to give of your time, give of your energy, in ways that you might not have been willing before. The second principle is restraint of the senses. In other words, you're not only careful about what comes out of your mind, you're also careful about what comes in, in terms of things you look at, things you listen to, smell, taste, touch, think about. You're careful not to focus on things that will give rise to greed or anger. Because if you're careless and you're looking, careless and you're listening, it's very difficult to be careful about your thoughts, because thoughts are so much more subtle. And this doesn't mean you don't look and or that you go around with blinders or plugs in your ears. Simply that you have skill in how you look at things. If you know that something tends to arouse lust or arouse anger, learn to look at it in a way that doesn't arouse the lust, that counteracts the lust, that counteracts the anger. In other words, if there's something that's attractive, you look at its unattractive side. If something is unattractive, you look at its attractive side. As a John Lee says, be a person with two eyes. This is why we have that contemplation of the body. It doesn't tell us not to look at the body, it says look more carefully at the body. Look at the parts that are not attractive, to balance out the one-sided view that simply focuses on a few details here and there, and then to blot out everything else in order to give rise to lust. After all, it's not the, the body is productive of lust. The mind many times wants to feel lust, and so it goes out looking for something to incite the lust. So again, it's keeping watch on what comes out of the mind and what comes in. 
for lay people, this also means being careful about the magazines you read, the TV you watch, the music you listen to. Be very careful about how you look at these things, how you listen to these things. And you find it's not a case of restricting yourself so much as it's learning to see things more carefully, more fully. Because again, you're seeing both sides of whatever it is that used to seem solely attractive or solely unattractive. It takes some effort. You have to be more energetic in watching about how you look and listen. But you find the benefit is that the mind is in much better shape to meditate, because you're not filling it up with all kinds of garbage, filling it up with all kinds of poison or junk food. That's going to harm it, weaken it. It's going to get in the way. So many times when you sit down to meditate, if you've been careless and about what's coming in and out of your mind, you find it's like, well, like this project of cleaning out the shed. There's just so much garbage in there. You spend the whole hour cleaning it out, and then realize you have only five minutes at the end. So keep it clean from the beginning. Don't let any garbage in the door or in the windows. And you find that you have a much nicer place to sit down and settle in when you create your meditation home. The third teaching is to be show restraint in your conversation. When I first went to stay with a John Fung, he said lesson number one in meditation is keeping control of your mouth. That was before you say something, ask yourself, is this necessary? Is this beneficial? Is there a good reason to say this? If there is, you can go ahead. If not, then just keep quiet. As he said, if you can't control your mouth, there's no way you're going to control your mind. And as you ask this question, you find that very little conversation really is necessary. If you're at work and you need to talk to your workers, okay, that counts as unnecessary. Or fellow workers need to talk to your fellow workers. It's, it's, just in order to create a good atmosphere, that does count as necessary speech, but so often it goes beyond that. You start getting careless, running off of the mouth, it turns into idle chatter, which is not only a waste of energy, but you also find that the things people say that cause the most harm are when they're just allowing whatever comes into the mind to go out their mouth without any restraint at all. And if you get to be known as a quiet person, well, that's, that's fine. You find that your words, if you're more careful about them, start taking on more worth. And at the same time, you're creating a better atmosphere after all. If you're constantly chattering all day long, how are you going to stop the mental chatter when you sit down to meditate? But if you develop this habit of watching over your mouth, the same habit then comes to apply to the meditation. Fourth lesson is to find, as for the monks, to frequent wilderness spots, to get out of society, find a quiet place to be by yourself, so you can get a sense of perspective on your life, a sense of perspective on your mind, so it's what's going on in your mind can stand out in bolder relief. This applies to lay people, too. You know, try to find as much solitude as you can. It's good for you. People who have trouble living in solitude shows that there's lots of unfinished business inside. So when you get a place where it's quiet, and even if it's just your own home, just make it a little wilderness place. Turn off the TV, turn out the lights, allow yourself to be alone. With a lot of, without a lot of distractions. You find, of course, that things that used to be kept under the surface of your mind come up to the surface, and it's when they come up to the surface that you can deal with them. And you find that when you're alone in this way, without a lot of input, it's natural the mind will tend to stay with the breath more easily. 
because after all you get fed up with all the chatter going on, and it's good just to be quiet. And also to get away from the influence of everybody else's thoughts and everybody else's opinions. You have to ask yourself, what do you really believe? What are your opinions? What's important to you? Which leads to the fifth lesson, which is to develop right view. Right view has two levels. There's belief in the principle of karma, that what you do really does have results. And it really is you acting. It's not some outside force acting through you. It's not the stars acting through you or some god, whatever. You are making the decisions. And you have the ability to make them skillful or not, depending on your intention. It's important to believe in this, because this is what gives more power to your life. It's an empowering belief. But it also involves responsibilities. This is why you have to be so careful, why you can't be heedless. When you're careful about your actions, it's easier to be careful about your mind when the time comes to meditate. As for the transcendent level of refuge, that's seeing things in terms of the Four Noble Truths. Just look at your experience, the whole range of your experience, and instead of dividing up into its usual patterns of me and not me, you simply look, okay, where is there suffering? Where is there stress? What goes along with it? What are you doing that gives rise to that stress? Can you let go of that activity? qualities do you need to develop? What things do you need to let go of in order to let go of that, the craving, the ignorance that underlie the stress? When you drop craving, can you be aware of what's happening? All too often we drop craving simply to pick up another craving. But can you make yourself more and more aware of that space in between and expand that space? What is it like to have a mind without craving. The Buddha pointed out why it's important to see things in this way. He says, if you look at everything in terms of yourself, how can you possibly understand? If you hold on to suffering as yourself, how can you understand suffering? If you look at it simply as suffering without putting this label of self on it, then you can start seeing for what it is and then learn how to let go. If it's yourself, you can't let go of it. If you hold to that belief that it's yourself. And looking at things in this way is what allows you to solve the whole problem of suffering. And start looking at your whole life in this, in this light. Instead of blaming your sufferings on people outside, look at what you're doing to create that suffering, to contribute to that suffering. And focus on dealing with that first. And when you develop this attitude in everyday life, then you can, it's a lot easier to apply it to the meditation. You create the environment where it makes more and more sense to stick to the noble path. So these are the factors that create the environment for the meditation. Whether you're a new monk living here in the monastery or a layperson living outside the monastery, 